Good evening and welcome again to Special Assignment. I'm your host, Ashraf Garda. In the past few weeks, Special Assignment has been off-air as we have been engaged in a revamp of the programme, which will be revealed to you soon. In the meantime, we continue with our rebroadcast of our previous most memorable programmes in celebration of our 16 years of excellence. The cultural practice of initiating young boys into manhood is once again in the spotlight. Since 2001, over 500 boys have died during initiation, and this week alone, 10 initiates were reported to have died in the Eastern Cape since the beginning of the winter initiation season. Tonight, we rebroadcast a 2008 investigation into some of the horrific abuses committed in the name of a noble and ancient coming of age ritual. The documentary Rites of Passage was produced by Hazel Friedman and won a highly commended award at the CNN African Journalist of the Year Awards in 2009. Every year in South Africa, hundreds of young men go to the bush for initiation, an ancient rite of passage during which they are deprived of the comforts of boyhood in preparation for their roles as men. Several weeks later, they will return to a joyous welcome by their communities, having made the transition to adult status unscathed. They represent the future of the nation. But for some, the crossover to manhood is not a triumphant journey, but a rite of horror. Some return with crippling genital mutilations, the consequence of botched circumcisions and inadequate aftercare. Some return permanently scarred from physical and emotional abuse. And for some, the journey into adulthood is one from which they will never return. This is one of the bridges straddling Cape Town's N2. From a distance, it seems to frame the adjoining settlement of crossroads like a steel halo. It is also the crossing for young men from nearby Guguletu and Nyanga into the bush for initiation. Buntu Majalaza was born in Guguletu on the 6th of March, 1982. He must have often seen that bridge. He probably even ventured close to the secret place where boys disappear for weeks before re-emerging as men. He was the only son of a single parent, Lulu, who handed over guardianship of the young Buntu to her employers who lived in Cape Town's southern suburbs. She wanted to give him opportunities she had never enjoyed. He didn't disappoint her. He was enrolled at the prestigious Sachs College in Cape Town, where he excelled. Buntu was, was very all-rounded at school. He, he loved cricket, he loved rugby, he was involved in, you know, in, in the teams at, at school. Um, he was a, a scorer, a basketball scorer, he loved basketball as well. Um, and he was really a friend to everybody. But his best friend was Jason Stanier. They met in grade eight, but their friendship was cemented in grade 10 through their spiritual commitment. I wouldn't be the man I am today without Buntu. I can say that categorically. I think with Buntu is, is that he responded so well to encouragement, even, even though he didn't need it. Uh, and with that response to encouragement, he blossomed. So he was really the kind of person that loved people, and his love for people transcended any cultural barrier whatsoever. He had friends from every community, and uh, he was very proud of where he came from. He loved his mother, he loved his mother's family. He was absolutely determined to make a success of his life. and. Um, we, in fact, we, we nicknamed, nick, nicknamed him the President. Uh, we called him President Buntu for at least two or three years because he was just the kind of person that was most likely to become President. In addition to being a spiritual mentor to his peers, Buntu was also a popular Christian youth leader. He conducted Bible classes for children for his people's church at the Baxter Theatre. In 2001, he was awarded a scholarship to UCT from where he graduated with a degree in Bachelor of Science. On the 6th of January, 2007, he joined a company called Smart Source Change Solutions. In December, 2007, he requested leave. He said to me, Ian, I really need some leave. I'm going to be away for two, three weeks. Responded, yeah, 
It's that time of the year where people take leave, go and enjoy it, have a rest. Not a word was, was, was mentioned about where, to, where he was going. I don't think even his closest friends knew. His dad was, wasn't really part of his life. I could see that had a huge effect on him. He had such a longing to, to get to know his dad and, and to, to really develop that relationship. Despite his education and spiritual maturity, Buntu was still regarded as a social child by members of his community because he had not undergone the traditional rite of passage into adulthood. At the age of 25, an age much older than many of the young men from his community who performed this rite of passage, he quietly decided to go to the bush. He left on the 22nd of December 2007. Nine days later, an old friend received a desperate call from Buntu's mother. On the 31st, it was Monday. Early in the morning, before 7 o'clock, Lulu found me. Sia, can you come here? Because Buntu is not all right. Then I find Buntu. When I saw Buntu, Buntu was very weak. And Buntu was complaining about her left arm could not move very well. Buntu was struggling to talk. The first phase of initiation includes circumcision, seclusion, and eight days of fasting in order to preserve ritual purity. After the traditional circumcision, the initiates, or abakweta as they are called, are cared for by a traditional nurse or kangata. I uh, call his kangata and I ask him, what happened for this boy? Kangata said, this boy didn't, is not eating well. I said, he's supposed to eat, Moses. After eight days, I asked the Kangata, could I go to farmers to buy something to boost Buntu's energy? Justice fetched medicine, but Buntu's condition had deteriorated. Soon after, he was admitted to Tigerberg Hospital in a coma. That was end. I didn't saw Buntu again. On the 6th of January 2008, Buntu Majalaza died of renal failure, possibly the result of a botched circumcision. He had also been viciously assaulted and tied up. His shelter in the bush was burnt to signify spiritual death, but the death of a man whose name means humanity was inhumane. It was terrible to hear about Buntu. Even um, I was many, had many questions why Buntu died. Uh, to think that um, he was allowed to, to pass in such a, a, a vile way, um, it was really difficult for us to understand. He was a man. He, he was a man and he didn't need to go to the bush to prove that. Um, you know, he was more of a man than most of us will, will ever be. Um, more on this issue when we come back. In the last 10 years, there have been at least 300 initiation-related deaths, and these are merely the reported cases. Sometimes when it comes to this ritual, a deafening silence prevails. But increasingly, brave men are speaking out. They say an honorable tradition is being brought into disrepute due to abusive, unsafe practices. In the northern province, Eastern Cape and the Free State, provincial laws regulate traditional initiation schools. Yet in the Western Cape, there are none. This makes it difficult to document death or injury or even the number of schools operating in the province. We do know of, 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 of sites that are being used for initiation practices, but uh, that might not necessarily be all the sites that are used. And in Cape Town, the bush is anything but that. During a time of discipline, abstinence and seclusion, urban temptations such as women and wine are simply a trot across the highway. Here yeah, in Western Cape, it's easy to get those things because they are around the, the area. 
In 2005, the shocking conditions of some initiation schools in Cape Town were exposed after the death of three initiates and injury of five in a single month. At hospitals such as GF Eusta and Tigerberg, where Buntu was admitted, doctors must treat horrific mutilations, the consequence of rusty blades and car seat belts employed as bandages. Most of them come because of infection, um, and that's often compounded on top of ischemia. In other words, they try to, to staunch the bleeding and then put on compressive dressings or maybe a, a little noose or a snare at the base of the penis to stop the bleeding, and that causes a poor blood supply to the tissue, which then becomes infected more easily. And that uh, often le leads to a loss of, uh, of tissue, usually the, the distal part, the tip of the penis, um, so the skin and the glands, the head of the penis, uh, can be lost. And then uh, in severe cases, uh, the whole penis can become gangrenous. And that then leads to sepsis, to generalized uh, septicemia, which can cause the patient's death. Compounding the problem is the fact that initiations are not held during the winter months, as was the traditional practice, but during the sweltering December, to coincide with school holidays. They are also um, not allowed to eat and drink, so they are dehydrated. But these complications can be treated. Buntu's death, for example, could have been prevented had he been taken to hospital in time. But those who go to hospital are often ostracized. If you just escape the doctor, not knowing you, you go there. When you come back, they will isolate you because you are the weak, we daughter, you're plastic. And unhygienic surgical practices and aftercare are not the only culprits in the abuse, injury, and deaths of initiates. There's some naughty men they used to, 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 go, to go there and beat them. That is, that is something was terrible, but that was not right. Kenneth Mbidlana's nephew also died after being initiated in Cape Town. Now Kenneth is determined to speak out against abusive practices. He points accusingly at negligent traditional nurses. Most of, of those in the Makangata, they leave the boys there in the bush and come to, to township to get uh, some beers, to get uh, all of those stuffs, leave the boy alone then, there's no one to look after them. Well, then it go, it go, it go back to, 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 the, to the guy there, that he was already drunk, and they make a mess to this one, and beat, and beat those, uh, those boys there. One of the men who died in this hospital had quite clearly been um, tied up uh, and probably beaten. If this was happening to women, there would be an international outcry. Yet many of those responsible for butchering these young men continue to operate with impunity. They will say they don't know what's uh, happening. They come back to They always say that. It's because they, they, they're scared to tell it the truth. But men like Justice and Kenneth are not encouraged to speak out. This is because the right is associated with secrecy. And women in particular are excluded. Even Buntu's mother was reluctant to talk about it. Information around the science, about, around the initiation, the initiates themselves, uh, those who are looking after them, uh, is not supposed to be for public consumption. For example, it, it generally is traditionally held that if your child were to die there, um, the, the mother in the household would not know, would not be told, until the last day when the, all the initiates come back. Um, so so, so if, you, if you just take that, you can see that if we're going to evolve and, and you know, uh, change people's mindset and you know, uh, inculcate a new culture, there are several cultural challenges that we need to deal with, including access to information, including that everybody that has got to do with initiation school get trained, they are aware of you know, um, the, 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 the cultural values and that these, this initiation school need to happen under good uh, you know, traditional and uh, good health conditions. To go to the bush, go to, to be a man that must come alive, must come alive. And I challenge my nation as Kosa people who are using this, this circumcision. I challenge them, more especially the elders, 
the family members. They must be uh, responsible for the guy going to the bush, must be modernized. I don't say they must polish, no, they must be modernized. We started to collect the data of, of, of surgeons and uh, traditional nurses, and we've trained uh, a, a number of them. I think 30 of them have been trained already. In Western Cape, we've got uh, multi-sectoral action teams. Uh, in the district, we've got facility boards, uh, at our health facilities, we, and then you've got um, you know, health committees. All these structures could be used to mobilize communities around knowledge. All the structures must be up and running come the winter season uh, for, for, for initiation schools. Yet there is still opposition to government interventions, and not solely from the more conservative sectors of society. As Tosas, we should be proud of our tradition. We should be able to sit down and, 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 and talk amongst each other and see ways. But we don't need some drastic interventions from the government. But in fact, these government initiatives are being welcomed by many traditional leaders, surgeons and nurses. After revisiting Buntu's initiation site, special assignment met this Kangata, who stressed the importance of safe practice. <laughs> As I quote Chief Ngangom Shaba Matanzima, they have treasured this Ukwaluga for 150 years. And now our kids will also go to the bush. So when they go to the bush, there must be no one who dies in the bush because it brings our tradition a shame. So how did this one end up? Find out after the break. Although they are neighboring provinces, the landscape of the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape seem planets apart. It is in these remote mountains that the Eastern Cape Health Department introduced laws regulating initiation schools. These include compulsory registration of surgeons and nurses, examination of initiates by doctors beforehand, as well as training, education and intervention campaigns. Our campaign has been very successful. We have had a number of interventions being put in place, the additional 4x4s, being dispatched to various parts of the province for monitoring purposes. We also trained more than 420 officers. There has been a 70% decline in unlawful initiations since the law was introduced in 2001. But death and injury are still rife, particularly during school holidays when many boys go to the bush. During April, there were two deaths. And during these June holidays, it was reported that 20 initiates had died. They've been given three weeks holidays and now they just rush and they, they went for, for the circumcision. At, at the moment we're having uh, two patients, three patients came in yesterday and the one came the day before yesterday. Uh, I only saw one of them and I have to be honest and say that his condition wasn't good at all. In the past year, over a hundred young men have been admitted to Mtata General Hospital, sometimes alive, sometimes dead. In some instances, they even uh, they, they can even lose the whole the whole penis. We've seen that here. It's not something that is, is very uncommon. You, you can lose the whole thing. You lose part of it. You lose the glands, and and because of all these other complications, then you also get you know urethral uh, complications, and that will mean that then it's going to be difficult for these boys, you know, to urinate. It is illegal to circumcise boys under the age of 18 without parental consent. Yet, in the village of Libodi, in this hut, are six underage initiates who were rescued by the health department from the clutches of an unregistered surgeon and a male nurse who was not much older than the initiates themselves. Earlier this morning, we received a call from the chief of this village that there was a problem. 
he reported that there were at least six uh, initiates that have been illegally circumcised, allegedly by one of the villagers. The department has reported successes in arresting and convicting many unregistered surgeons and nurses. Yet backyard operations continue to mushroom, not only in the Eastern Cape, but also in the Western Cape, where they cannot be legally prevented from operating. Now that the practice is regulated in the Eastern Cape, uh, you find uh, certain surgeons, uh, or, or traditional uh, surgeons, um, moving out of Eastern Cape, coming into the Western Cape to do the practice because they either are not qualified to, do, to, to be surgeons in the Eastern Cape nor have been, been registered. And, and, and that also creates a problem. Some of them are being motivated by money, they are greedy. We have on occasion asked these men uh, what they paid for the circumcision and the amounts are quite, uh, quite large. Any general practitioner would gladly do 10 circumcisions for the, for the price that's asked for one of these. I can estimate uh, it can be close to uh, 4,000. But uh, because of, of our proactive approach <coughs> and our rapid response when we get such calls, we manage to control, to put the situation under control. That may be, but rampant abuse of this traditional rite of passage has also become a human rights issue. John Smythe is a retired Queen's Counsel and constitutional law expert. He is representing 19-year-old Bonani Yamani. In August, Bonani will launch a lawsuit in the Bishu High Court against his father and traditional leaders for unlawful circumcision. Bonani was circumcised in hospital, but the elders allegedly abducted him for another circumcision and allegedly forced him to swallow pieces of his remaining foreskin. This is not part of any tradition. But Bonani does not seek financial damages. The declaration we're asking for is simply, well, there are two really. One, that what happened to Bonani in the early hours of the morning of the 3rd of March was illegal and should never have happened. And I don't think there can be any argument about that. Secondly, that it was also improper, if not illegal, for the chiefs to encourage uh, ostracism of this young man. But if conducted safely, initiation signifies a triumphant rite of passage into adulthood. In the town of Berlin, outside East London, one of the recent graduates of the bush is a white teenager. He decided to be initiated together with his best friend. His father gave his consent and the pair completed their initiation on December the 22nd, ironically the day that Buntu Majalaza began his. When I came out, my father was very proud of me. It was the first time I saw a white man go in the bush, so I liked it. Our constitution recognizes the importance and benefits of traditional practices such as initiation. But the South African Human Rights Commission has warned that the tradition is increasingly open to corruption by those who care more for financial gain than for the welfare of Abakweta in their care. The Commission warns that unless adequate and safe practices are applied, this coming-of-age ritual for many young men will become not a source of honor and celebration, but of grief and shame. So what's your take on this issue? Well, you can post your comments in one of three ways, Twitter, Facebook, or via email. Well, that's it for tonight. Thank you for watching, and do tune in again next week when we continue to point out the issues that matter.